Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thankful to see everybody here this morning. Thankful for God's grace and mercy that allows us to be here. I hope and pray that we come here having our hope, our eyes, our hearts, our anticipation centered firmly upon Him. Life's full of troubles. Life's full of challenges. But Jesus said he gave us a crown of life. That he has called us to a more abundant life. We well, invite you to turn with us this morning to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. When we begin in the second chapter, first verse. <clears throat> Ephesians 2 and 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses, and sins. Now, in case you were wondering, I, I, I've heard people say over the years that the italicized words were added, that, that they really weren't part of the scripture, that, you know, we, some folks have even insisted that we ought to skip over them. But in fact, as it is oftentimes with languages, Sometimes from one language to another, there is no direct translation from the words in the original language to an equivalent in the language that it's being translated into. Your italicized words in the scripture weren't just thrown in there. They weren't just added. It was to indicate that whatever word was used in the original, there wasn't a direct translation from one language to the other, and the scholars determined that this was as close as they could come when they were, when they were making their translations. So don't feel like you're taking anything away from or adding anything to the scriptures when you read the italicized words. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. That word quicken literally means to make alive. You are dead in trespasses and sins. <coughs> now I know that, that you know it, it's popular and, and 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 you know I can you know certain scriptures you read you can understand why folks might get that idea and that's why it, it, it's so important that we take the scriptures as a whole when we are studying God's word. Because there, there's a very, to me, a very evident and very simple truth in, the, in, in this first verse right here. Dead men don't do anything. You have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. You couldn't ask to be quickened. You couldn't choose to be quickened. It didn't matter to you one way or the other in that state because you were dead. A rock doesn't care where it lays. A rock doesn't care how hot it is or how cold it is. It's dead. You have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. To me, Paul pretty clearly establishes here that God did not need or want our help. You have he quickened. Doesn't say that he wanted to quicken you, that he desired to quicken you, that he quickened you if you let him. Because you, as I said, you were dead. You weren't in any state to let. You have he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins, 
We're in in time past. He walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The prince of the power of the air. Most all of us understand that to be a reference to Satan. And I want to tell you something. A prince is as close as he will ever come to being referred to in royal, as royalty in any shape, form, or fashion. And all this meant was that he was chief of the power of the air. Wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Well, now why is it important that we understand that, 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 that Prince is, is the, the, as close as he comes to, to a royal attribute. Because we have been taught and told that, that he has the kingdom, of, that, that, that hell is his kingdom, right? That, that that's where he rules and reigns. I want to tell you something. He has never been in any way, shape, form, or fashion anywhere in the lens of God's word referred to as a king. And if he's not a king, then he doesn't have a king. Our God holds the keys of death and hell, of death and the grave. Satan is not a king. He has no dominion other than that which from time to time God might allow in order to prove us. He realized that he couldn't touch Job until God told him that he could. And then God told him just how much he could touch him and where he would stop touching him. Don't ever, I, I'm not saying that, that, that we don't have an adversary in this world. I'm not saying that, that, that Satan is not our foe. I'm not saying that, 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 we don't, that, that he doesn't have fiery darts to throw at us. What I'm saying to you is this, that our God is in control even of that and that he has provided us a means whereby that we might even quench the fiery darts of Satan. He's the prince of the power of the air. He is king of nothing. He has no right or authority or ability to rule in your life as long as you are looking to the king. <clears throat> We're in, in time past you walked according to this. See, this is, this is your past. This is how you walked before you were quickened. You said, well, what did you? you said dead men couldn't do anything. They can't. You're familiar with the term called dead man walking. And that refers to inmates on death row that are taking their final walk. But I want to assure you that until the Lord quickens us, this world is full of dead men walking. When it comes to the things of God and the love of God and loving the things of God, this world is full of dead men walking unless and until he, by the power of his Holy Spirit, quickens them. And then, praise God, we can, like Paul, say we're in in time past we walked in such a way. The Spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. What Paul just tell you? That you're not any better than the next fella. That you, in and of yourself, are no different from the most heinous individual that you can think of. 
He didn't say some of us had our conversation there. He said we all had our conversation there. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature the children of wrath. Even See, this is our nature. It is our nature, our carnal nature, to be the children of wrath. And the only thing that changes that is the quickening power of the true and living God. There is no other source. There is no other fountain. There is no other place that we can turn. No other power that we can look to. Your mama and daddy didn't give it to you. Your, son, your children can't give it to you. You can't pass it on to other, to other generations. Most of you know that my dad's a preacher. Been preaching about two years longer than I have. I want to tell you something. I did not inherit my call to, the, to preach the gospel from my daddy. Brother Bill Taylor was here last week. His dad was a preacher. He's got a brother that's a preacher. Brother Bill did not inherit his calling to preach because his daddy and his brother are preachers. Your parents might have been members of this church. Your grandparents might have been members of this church. Your great-grandparents might have been founding members of this church. But if you are here as a part of the body of Christ, whatever position they might have held has nothing to do with who you are and why you're here and what you ought to be doing while you're here. You are here because God has quickened you and made you alive, and in that life he has stirred up in you a desire to come together to love him, to serve him, to praise him, and to love and serve one another. So that means we all see everything just alike and all, and, 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 and we get along rosily, right? No. We know better than that. Because, you see, we see through a glass darkly in a lot of ways. And I promise you that over the years I've had brethren that I nearly love we sit down and talk about a scripture that I thought was pretty plain. <laughs> and but when we got through the conversation, we discovered that we must have been reading something different. Now, God reveals to us according to his purpose and our need. And the fact that he does not always reveal to us exactly the same understanding of Scripture is his business. And we just need to pray and to trust him. I think we all know that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the only mediator between man and God. He is the only means whereby that our sins are washed whiter than snow and separated from us as far as the east is from the west. He is our only hope of eternal glory and he is the only begotten son of God. And as long as we know that together, you know, the rest of the stuff we can talk about and reason together over and study together with, and we may, we, we may never come to the same conclusion about some of those things. And that's all right as long as we never lose sight of the fact that we're brothers and sisters. As long as we never lose sight of the fact that the same God has quickened us and made us alive and that he is the only reason that we're not walking where we used to walk and thinking the things we used to think and doing the things that we used to do and that we can glorify him together for those things among whom also we all had our conversation in times past. But God, we hear a word, a phrase thrown around a lot in this world. They call it a game changer. That's a game changer. And I'm going to tell you something. Anytime that you're reading God's word and you come to that, those two little words right there that says, but God, you just hit a game changer, let me tell you. But God, 
who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins. Now, as children of obedience, we need to walk righteously before God our Father. But I'm going to tell you something right here and now. That God, thankfully, God does not wait for us to get righteous before he works a work in us. Because if that were the case, guess what? God wouldn't have anything to do. Because we're never going to get there on our own. We're not going to seek it on our own. We don't, we don't care. Without the abiding grace of God in our hearts and lives, we could care less about whether or not our walk is righteous, about whether or not it pleases God, about whether or not we show kindness and love, not only to our brothers and sisters, but to the stranger we pass on the street. That comes not from our nature, but from God's nature. What a glorious thing it is and how humble we ought to be to understand understand that God our Father said he made us in his image. A lot of folks tell me I'm in the image of my dad. I'm not my dad. But I saw some cousins the other day that I, that I hadn't seen in a long time. And had a couple of them take one look at me and tell me, well, I would have known who you belonged to if I'd passed you on the street. You see, I carry his image. I'm not him, but I carry his image. It lets folks know that we're family. Whenever they were questioning Jesus about whether or not it was right to pay taxes, and he took the coin and he showed it to him and he said, whose superscription is this? Now that word superscription meant whose image is stamped on this coin? Whose superscription is this? And they said, Caesar's. And he said, well then render to Caesar that which is Caesar's and unto God that which is God's. But do you understand the deeper meaning of what he was saying there? The reason that that was identified as belonging to Caesar is because it had Caesar's image. The reason you are identified as belonging to God is because you bear the image of your heavenly Father. He does not touch your life. Without, I, I, again, that, that old, you, you, we hear it all the time. That's going to leave a mark. Let me tell you something, child of God. Whenever God touches you, it leaves a mark. Thanks be unto God, it leaves a mark. It, dis, it, it sets you apart. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us. When I saw it after, when I went looking for it, when I decided I wanted it, no, even when we were dead in sins. You see, God's great love for me and you existed when we were dead in sin. And God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, hath quickened us together with Christ. You see, he hasn't just made us alive. He's made us alive together with his only begotten son. We are bound in him. We are, we are covered by him. We are sheltered in him. And as such, we have, uh, we, we have a responsibility to live a different life. Now, living that different life is not what makes us a child of God. Living that different life is what manifests God's work in our hearts. 
And it's good that we manifest that word. It's good that we manifest to the world that there's something different. Let them think that we're odd. But let it be for the right reasons. Let it be because that we walk in the light of God's grace and mercy. And not because we think it's incumbent upon us to, to do things just to be different. If God's working in our lives, we don't have to try to be different. We are different. He has made us different. And He is that difference. I'm sure I've told some of you at least my little grandmother lived a little over 100 years old, a member of the church most all of her life. And she observed one time, she said, well, I have been in a discussion about some of the things that were going on with some of the churches at the time. She said, I reckon we read in the Bible where God's people was a peculiar people, and so we just set out to see how queer we could be. I'm afraid sometimes that's what we've done. We have set out to make the difference. We have set out to, to, to make sure that we look different. We, we, we haven't gone along because these folks jumped off in this ditch over here. We jumped off in this ditch over here because we didn't want the people to think we was like them folks. But I'm going to tell you something. A ditch is a ditch. Walk in the king's highway. And don't worry about who's in the ditch on either side. Walk in the king's highway. If you find a brother in the ditch and you can help him, help him. But walk in the king's highway. Even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. The scripture expounds a lot about grace. By grace ye are saved. Say, and you say, yes, yeah, by grace, but I've got to do so and so to get that grace. Well, if I've got to do, then that becomes a work, doesn't it? And Paul says, if it's a works, then it's no more of grace. <clears throat> grace is unmerited favor. I didn't deserve it. I didn't do anything to deserve it. I couldn't do anything to deserve it. If I can do something to get it, then it's not grace, it's a reward. It's according to my labor. By grace ye are saved. So let's go back and get some of the phrases again. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us hath quickened us together with Christ and hath raised us up together. The implication here is raised us up together with Christ. He has quickened us together with Christ. He has made us alive with Christ. Now I've got a question for you. How is Christ alive? He is alive and alive forevermore, isn't he? He is alive and death has no hold over him. Death can never claim him. Death can never touch him. You are quickened together with Christ and have raised us up together. The, the implication being there again, with Christ. And made us sit together. in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Made us sit together. See, that, that, that's not you, David said, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. I don't believe the word there is so much force as it is that he designed. By God's design, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. By God's design, he has made us sit together. He has made us sit together.
You think we'd all sit here in love and peace and fellowship without God? About half of us are Auburn fans and the other half are Alabama fans. That alone is enough to make bitter enemies out of some people. I like chocolate. You may like vanilla. Sister Hugh, you bet don't like any kind of Chinese or Vietnamese or Taiwanese food. Now, we could tell Sister Hugh Beth when we decide what we're going to go eat on Sunday, well, that's tough. We're just going to go anyway. <laughs> but our heart wouldn't let us do that, would it? <laughs> we find a lot more joy in saying, well, we can go eat here. We, we can all do that. It's fine. It's good. You say, well, that, that's foolish. No, that's not foolish. That's the love and the grace of God in our lives because were it not for that, that's exactly what we tell Sister Hugh Beth. Well, that's tough. I'm Chinese. Because that's their nature. It is only by the quickening grace of God that we give any consideration to the desires and the needs and, 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 and the joy of our brothers and sisters in Christ because God has made us sit together in heavenly places, given us joy in the simplest thing. I've said it before, I'll say it again. That is one of the sweetest distractions that has ever been. Makes my soul rejoice. That he has made us all sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Outside of these three ladies right here, I don't figure anybody in this building has known me more than five or six years. Don't think I've known any of you more than five or six years. I might go back a little more than that. It might be nine or ten. Some of you came to the Central States Bible Conference when I was at Mount Tabor. And yet, God has so bound us that I literally cannot imagine a life that does not have you in it. That's why I'm going back to Indiana this afternoon. You see, God so knits us and joins us together. makes us willing to go to what some people would think are extreme lengths to minister to one another. I don't feel like there's anything extreme about it, really. I'm humbled that God would so bind us together that even after years and many miles, People still find comfort in our being together. And this is what God has done. I forgot to turn my watch on, I'm sorry. This is what God has done. He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, you see, Paul knew they weren't through. <laughs> In the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. All that we receive from God comes to us through Christ Jesus. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. God who is rich in mercy. For his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin. 
آن که سعی کن نتی این دیگه مایی پلیه رو آن که سعی کن در تشکیل گیرز از گریس در اندرستان که این سید I was found of them that sought me not. I was found by folks that weren't looking for me. We weren't looking for God when we found Him. But He knew where we were. And He saw to it that we found Him. How thankful we ought to be for God's sweet grace in our lives. May God bless and keep you all. May He fill your days with His love, your hearts with His peace. May the trials and the tribulations of this world fade in the view of His great love that has made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. May God bless.